Yeah, I've dunked on vapid top 5 lists in a previous video. That was satire, and this one is about satire. We're counting down the 5 most satirical factions in Warhammer. Emphasis on most, cutting straight to the protein, so there won't be any contrived reaches about how, I don't know, Korn's obsession with skulls is a satire of 19th century pseudoscience, or something. Although Even apart from a strictly materialist analysis of how the manufacture of Games Workshop commodities mobilise forces of production that reflect and are reflected in the law, the art, aside from all of that, Warhammer has a lot going on. We've looked at how the Stormcast's evolving narrative role critiques liberal ideology, and if we can wring juice out of that dry old potato, just you wait till we get to the greater gourd. Looking at Warhammer factions for satire ain't gonna have the same cachet as analysing well, cachet. But satire has never been confined to a single medium, and certainly isn't now, so it's better to describe the emergent traits of text we deem satire as being satirical. What we need is a clear, robust definition. What a satire is, satire is when it's the same as here, uh, but there's animals in it. Yeah, that'll work. Satire was invented as an excuse to say edgy things on the internet, and later iterated upon in ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome. I think I got the chronology right. Rome is where we see different styles codified. The works of Horace, ahem, <coughs> Horace, like with a C, represent one approach, specialising in gently ridiculing the foibles of institutions with a sympathetic eye. Then there's Juvenal, famed for scornful, irony-laden attacks. These modes aren't totally mutually exclusive, but I'm just going to state out the gate. I think the Juvenalian approach is better, and I'll let one of the best satirists of our time, Chris Morris, explain why. The problem is that I think we've got used to a kind of satire which essentially placates the court. You do a nice dissection of the way things are in the orthodox elite, and lo and behold you get slapped on the back by the orthodox elite, who say, jolly good, can you do us another one? The Horatian satire absolves through analysis, while Juvenalian is inherently anti-establishment. Since the establishment is capitalist, the left tends to excel at articulating these critiques. But they aren't the only ones who try. Later, we'll tackle a faction which embodies a critique that is far from a leftist one. I'm sure you all know about the death of the author. There are a billion videos about that topic. Satire magnifies existing tensions about authorial intent, but the factions I'm analysing are composites of many different writers' works. And anyway, Modern Games Workshop erases authorship of its codexes. We're forced to read content rather than intent, and that might open some interesting avenues to analyse texts that seem at odds with the company's stated liberal outlook. It's true that many great satires are designed to be provocations to interpretation, not didactic messages, but I don't think this completely contradicts my aim to find critiques that can be coherently decoded. It's not all or nothing. Take two edgy skit YouTubers who maintain political kayfabe. JREG and Bro Science Life. Bro Science Dom's channel depicts the toxic masculinity of lifting bros, and it's hard to tell how ironic it all is, but the focus on the pseudoscientific arrogance provides a clear satirical foundation on which to build this ambiguity. JREG's gimmick is built on the implicit validation of the political compass, which is the political science equivalent of muscle confusion. That's where the separation of genre and mode comes in handy. I can criticise JREG for model satire, without saying his content is bad. Though, Dom is also funnier. Damn, it is Virgin vs Chad. This is kind of turned into dunking on postmodernism. We're all shit posters here, that's okay, but I would just say that, to me, a commitment to doubleness which both legitimises and subverts that which it parodies isn't the highest form of satire. With apologies to Linda Hutchin, I'm going to be using Frederick Jameson's description of postmodern pastiche as a hollow version of parody. It's speech in a dead language, and the past as referent finds itself gradually bracketed and then effaced altogether, leaving us with nothing 
nothing but texts. I think this is relevant to many Warhammer factions, especially Warhammer Fantasy. Tomb Kings, Lizard Men, Ogres, etc. grab attention with their historically grounded aesthetic. They are successful if there's enough narrative content to efface this cultural pastiche. And in the case where there is no added character, we have problematic stuff like Nippon, Araby, Cathay. Still, when you're using cultures for a toy soldier game, it's all well and good to satirise ideologies, but parodying cultures, especially non-Western ones from a Eurocentric point of view, well... And I find it kind of funny. I find it kind of sad. I call Creek players racist, but I play for her rad. The distinction between cultural pastiche and political parody is not always so easy to disentangle, and the use of allegory is a big reason why. That's what Stuart Lee's animal joke is getting at. Satirical points are often best communicated through the juxtaposition of an unusual premise. Warhammer commits to doing unconventional spins on existing archetypes. You know, what if ogres were hot? What if ogres were cold? What if ogres did what they were fucking told? Satire is not the same as comedy, but it shares with it a preference for resolution. A punchline which synthesises the thematic dialectic. The Warhammer lore won't conclude, its factions are strongly differentiated societal concepts that exist in a wider narrative setting as a facsimile of thematic synthesis. Ah, uh, damn, that was pretentious. Well, what I mean to say is satire has a punchline and Warhammer factions um, punch all the time. <sighs> Jesus fucking Christ, one more time. Warhammer factions are collections of consistent traits that we can analyse. Okay, to sum up, my judgments will be based on the stir system. Good satire entails strong critique, told through allegory, in a way that isn't contradictory, and we're reading content, not intent. Cool, uh, next time we'll use the dawn system. Don't finish, act- We are starting with this pair because the satirical overlap is fair. Orcs and Ogres both represent a take on the lumpen proletariat, that is, the oppressed class that is outside of the proletariat. Now neither of these factions are literally lumpen, as it's a term that describes a class, not a society. But let's get into the thematic parallels. Orcs have been around since Warhammer 40k's inception in 1987, back when Games Workshop was still doing explicit political jabs. Look at the Nazi uniforms of the Storm Boys, or the most prominent Orc warboss, Mag Uruk Thraka, aka the Iron Orc, whose name might be based on Margaret Thatcher. Though this is disputed, actually, this has been debunked. Similarly, the Warhammer fantasy character Heinrich, Him <clears throat> Heinrich Kemmler's name is actually Ancient Nehekaran. <sighs> It, it, it's debatable, okay? Whether intended or not, the Thatcher link would make sense. Apart from Tolkien, the biggest influence on Orc identity was 70s and 80s English skinhead culture. You can see it in the clothing, from the Doc Martens and jeans combo to suspenders and check patterns. This goes further than just visuals. Orc dialect is an exaggerated version of southern working class slang, and their mindless lust for violence parodies football hooliganism that skinheads were known for. Some skinheads channeled their class alienation in a positive way, but it was on the whole a rightward turn from punk, with many supporting the fascist National Front Party. Though Thatcher headed the UK's right-wing neoliberal swerve, the NF was still unimpressed, but this would change when she started giving off major rivers of blood vibes. That this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. The NF lost 160,000 voters in four years. My racism brings skinheads to the yard makes the Tory vote better than yours. That's kind of interesting. 40k comes out a few years after this right-wing consolidation and features Mag Uruk Thraka, the Iron Orc that manages to unite a mass of hooligans under his banner. But here's the thing, Orcs are one of the least fascist factions in 40k. Sure, they view other life forms as lesser and weaker, but they don't kill them because of that. There ain't no Orc hate crime, they just love crime. Despite the odd swastika, Orcs aren't really satirising the fascist part of skinhead hooliganism. Let's move on to Ogres. Usually overshadowed by their green cousins, it's a fun contrast. The comedy of Orcs is that they're completely impossible to reason with, while Ogres are too reasonable, pliable even. Check out Dawn's Maneater video for more details on how Ogres enthusiastically adopt the cultures of their employer. 
and there's also their naive habit of collecting big names, which are often just insults they don't understand. The lore describes them as dim, one of the last species to be rushed out by the old ones like an essay they didn't proofread, but it's more like they're unambitious. The classic line is that ogres are thick as two short planks, but smart enough to tie those planks together and beat you to death with them. Brilliant but lazy. If orcs capture the unfocused hooliganism of the Lumpen, ogres embody the resigned lack of class consciousness. The Great Maw's curse of hunger drives them to destructive, unethical consumption. They are victimised in their exile from Cathay, but when they reach the mountains of Morn, they eat all the native Sky Titans, destroy this civilization, the only remnants of which are busted up cannons ogres bring to battle on cattle. That plot point is clearly invoking the Mongols, the culture that the ogre aesthetic is based on, but I think the obviousness of this influence allows us to pry apart pastiche from parody. For example, ogre wanderlust to visit exotic places, meet interesting stimulating people and eat them is a unique element that stands out from the pastiche, and so it's easier to read as a satirical take on modern class dynamics, in this case petty grifters. Tolkien's influence on orcs means there's a mongol connection there too, but setting aside the spectre of racism, 40k's orcs are complicated because they embody a specific regional subculture that is inseparably tied to the class that's being satirised. Orcs are infuriatingly unsubtle, but also kind of hard to read, like handwritten Tarantino scripts. The confusion of class and culture is a very common flaw in liberal satire, like how Harry Enfield's ironic loads of money character erased the distinction between workers and bosses, which just complemented Thatcher's ideology. Here's a more recent example, a scene from the god-awful attempt at satire that was Brexit Uncivil War. You do know who Aaron Banks is? I know UKIP might give off this blokey, jokey vibe, but I'm afraid a lot of their views are, well, nothing to laugh about. If these right-wing thugs try and run the out campaign, they'll kill it. <laughs> it's really funny. Not the scene, it's total failure to communicate the point. The characters call UKIP right-wing thugs, uh, side note, the guy saying that, Douglas Carswell, would later defect to UKIP. Problem is, literally the most evil thing they do in the film is behave like lads on a stag. That was the fucking issue with resurgent English nationalism, phallic drinking. Ironically, the movie's failure to articulate why UKIP is bad is a perfect reflection of the Brexit debate itself, hollow culture posturing that ignores material politics. Sorry for that tangent, I wanted to demonstrate the prevalence of conflating class and cultural signifiers, especially in Britain. We're more aware of class hierarchies here than the US, how could we not when most of our leaders come from the same school, but that doesn't translate into a good understanding. All that considered, orcs and ogres commendably focus on dynamics over superficial signifiers, though with the orcs it's kind of hard to disentangle. They each represent a way that the Lumpen exercises its directionless alienation. Hooliganism, petty crime, these tendencies are framed in a fantasy allegory and also become innate psychological features of their race. Orcs literally exist to fight and ogres are preoccupied with consumption. Their behaviour is decontextualised from explicable condition, so empathy becomes difficult. On the other hand, their raucous joy or unmalicious curiosity creates sympathy, even if we can't fully comprehend their emotional state. Well, this applies more to orcs. Ogres are pretty well-rounded characters. No, that's not a part. They fulfil exaggerated stereotypes of the Lumpen, yet remain more likeable than almost anyone else in the setting. It adds up to Horatian satire, affectionate, a little patronising, and lacking a coherent throughline. Actually, quick addendum, Age of Sigmar ogres have split into two cultures, Gutbusters, a continuation of the Ogre Kingdoms, and Beastclaw Raiders, which are climate refugees with primitive communist societies. Ogre Moor Tribes is a book literally divided into left and right wing halves. Wait, it's even implied on the first page. GW, did you do this on purpose? Nah, it's certainly accidental, and that means it's easier to appropriate, because the grimdark elements aren't a satirical critique of leftism. Mm, hold that thought.
The Gene Stealer cults are secret societies that worship the star gods and plan to rise up against their oppressive Imperium masters. Aesthetically influenced by various Marxist insurrections, they are the most prominent version of the communist revolutionary in 40k. They have a codex, okay? That all sounds good, right? Are these the unambiguous goodies? Well, there's more. Despite their stated aims of emancipation, the cults are ruled by literal patriarchs who assert their control with a gene stealer kiss. Yeah, that was the issue with the xenomorph from Alien. It wasn't rapey enough. But worse even than that, or the cult's weird eugenic hierarchy, is its secret goal. You see, the patriarchs aren't just doing this because they care about emancipation of the proletariat. It's all a plan to entice the Tyranids. The star gods these cultists worship are aliens that seek to devour them, and the revolution is what will prepare the planet for their arrival. Huh, maybe the gene stealers aren't so woke after all. What if anti-fascists are the real uncle fascists? Wait, that's not- Okay, so they certainly have their pros and cons, but the question is, are they satirical? To answer this, let's compare the Gene Stealers with another 40k faction which is often described as communist, the Tau. Now, the Tau technically aren't communist for one simple reason. No, it isn't that. Tau society is divided into population segments described as castes, but rather than the racialized class inequality this might imply, these castes are more like distinct cultures, whose societal roles may be different, but their hierarchical status isn't. Like many things about the Tau, the term caste is basically just a signifier for their non-specific Asian theme. The reason Tau aren't communists is simpler, they have a strong state. The state is inherently an apparatus for class repression, and communism requires the withering away of the state. In practice, this means a transitional stage of socialism achieved through a proletarian revolution, where the state still exists to repress the emergence of the bourgeois class. While the greater good philosophy isn't Marxism, Tao evoke socialism by way of pastiche. Codexes don't get too specific with their mode of production, but it seems that the state maintains a cosmopolitan society with high living standards. Damn, this was supposed to be about the lumpy lumpen, but it just ended up being overshadowed by the goody Tao shoes. The point is that the Tao, like the gene stealers, embody a preferable alternative to the Imperium, but also have their grim dark elements. They are an expansionist empire ruled by an unaccountable ethereal caste. Now, here's a question for both examples. Do these grim dark elements critique the faction's leftism in a satirical way? With the Tao, I'd say generally no. Their imperial expansion is narratively justified, those subsumed into the Tao Empire have their material conditions improved, and the act of expansion is portrayed as necessary for this least bad empire to improve their slim chances of survival against much larger and worse threats. Ethereals using mind control? Arguably that plays into the leftist hive mind joke, but it is canonically unconfirmed, and can also be interpreted as a critique of the Imperium being unable to comprehend those motivated by anything other than devotion to the god emperor or coercion. Basically, Tao bad bits aren't really satirising socialism, but with the gene stealers it's a whole different case. The grimdark elements actually make their revolution false, it's all lies and hypocrisy, underpinning a nihilistic death cult. The Gene Sealer cults are the closest thing the setting has to a fascist satire of the left. Like, let's pass this. Aliens subverting society, preaching an agenda of emancipation and liberation, which is a front for a secret plan to bring a foreign threat to destroy the world. This is hitting all the beats of cultural Marxism conspiracies. The scheming patriarchs represent the secret Jewish cabal. The false revolution represents the degenerate values propagated by Frankfurt School academics. And the Tyranids are the migrants bringing white genocide. I'm sure many of you knew where I was going. It's so obvious this book noticed. Using Gene Stealer cult like this unfortunate reminiscent to how reactionaries have meme the GSC to be cultural Marxism. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the one who basically started that with the feminids. It's a bit far to claim an obvious interpretation as an original stroke of genius. Arch hasn't started a movement, 
Judging by the raw chicken pallor of his face, he ain't getting enough fibre to start a bowel movement. I'm just razzing, you look fine. Maybe a little unhealthy, but DM me, I can get your macronutrients sorted out. And bro, I've heard the way you forced that laugh. You've got an impressive VO2 max, dude. You just need the right diet and cardio program, because you've got the potential to be in a I've already talked about intent, but it might be worth reiterating. No, I don't think GW intended to replicate a Nazi conspiracy theory. What I do think is that when it came to adding the requisite grit, that each 40k faction needs to be appropriately anti-heroic. The liberal writing self simply lacked an awareness of fascist paranoia and made a far-right satire by accident. We're on the same wavelength, right? Everyone thinks it. The difference is, we're not afraid to say it. Oh shit. Oh bollocks. Of course. I can't just make a nice normal faction. Oh no, that would be far too simple. I'm not saying that leftist gene stealer fans are idiots. I get it. The aesthetic is nice and on a superficial level provides a fun proletarian revolution fantasy. This is more like a self-awareness check. Here's a purely theoretical example. Imagine if fascists found a Warhammer faction that aligned with their power fantasy, purposely ignored the fact the text criticises it, and then appropriated it as uncomplicatedly good. When savvier people point out this contradiction, they have to come up with these contrived reasons why the text doesn't actually say that, or the faction isn't actually fascist, or all of the above, and also Warhammer isn't political. I mean, you'd find that level of cope kind of funny, right? Just a thought. Okay, now we're into the big leaks with the most obscure entry on this list. Well, it's probably making one viewer happy. The flesh eater court are ravenous cannibalistic ghouls led by feral vampires. They eat almost as much as ogres, but are still shredded. Clearly, they're on steroids. I mean, look at that back knee. Every flesh eater court begins with infection. Not physical disease, but a delusion. Ghoul kings believe themselves to be civilized monarchs, and the unfortunate sucked into their orbit come to believe it too as these people are transformed into abject creatures. They perceive their leader as an honourable knight with a good haircut and not the ghoul underneath. You can probably see the potential for dramatic irony. There's some flavour text about a lord who was traumatised by a beast and now spends his life searching for it. Gloomheart even glimpsed his prey, always reflected for but a moment in the eyes of dying men and so his hunt continues. Ever since Bram Stoker brought the legend into modernity, vampires have been used to represent the predations of the bourgeoisie. Such references are not uncommon in Marx's writing. However, if we want to talk literary influences, which I guess you can take alongside the gene stealers representing the anarchist cookbook and the ogre kingdoms representing an actual cookbook, you'd be hard pressed to sum up any faction as succinctly as Dracula meets Don Quixote. Cervantes' novel, well, novels, are about a wealthy old man whose obsession with chivalric romances has made him think he is a knight. Don Quixote imposes his anachronisms on a bemused world in a similarly absurd, if less horrific, way to the flesh eaters, which often leads to his reluctant peasant sidekick, Sancho Panza, getting injured. Don Quixote is as harsh a class critique as you can expect from 1605. There's a really biting section in book two where a duke and duchess literally troll the duo, encouraging Don's delusions and Sancho's peasant practicality for their own amusement, like it's their own private screening of the room. Presumably, the only thing stopping elves from doing this to ghouls is that they'd graciously retrieve those spoons and scoop out their eyes. So Feck are riffing on an inherently allegorical horror trope, and also one of the greatest satires of all time? That's performance enhancing pastiche, satirical steroids. Okay, it is a bit more nuanced than that. The big difference is that Don Quixote is one afflicted man interacting with society, while the flesh eaters are entire societies held together by collective delusion. So despite the literary influence, I think Feck have more to say about ideological hegemony. Antonio Gramsci expanded on Marx's concept of base and superstructure to explain that state apparatus is only half of how the bourgeoisie maintain dominance. Hegemonic rule is achieved through the propagation of ideology at the level of civil society, an artificial consensus that is understood by the people as common sense. Thus, hegemony is characterised by the predominance of consent, though it is still underpinned by coercion. The Flesh Eater Delusion is an extremely stark version of this. The Ghoul King's magic falsifies a consensus for feudal hierarchies, but it goes further than the mere ideological
physiological and into the epistemic, imposing warped subjectivity on their underlings' very perceptions of reality. So it's a double hegemony, making ghouls believe they're something they're not, and making them believe that thing is good. Hegemony tends to manifest more subtly, often reinforced in cultural artefacts. Take the show Friends, which appears to break from the traditional nuclear family sitcom to something more relatable, yet in doing so, strengthens hegemonic notions of what the relatable is. The relatable is white, heterosexual. It can embody different cultural signifiers of class, but since they live in spacious New York apartments without financial concerns, it's functionally the same class. And since this is relatable, it must be easily achievable, right? That's just common sense. Similarly, the Morgant Grand Court propagates a culture of chivalry and honour, which even has a degree of social mobility, so is self-evidently beneficial for all, right? The brutal slaughter that underpins it is obscured, just like the poverty that exists beyond the peripheries of New York sitcom Utopia. Oh no, are we gonna do another- That tastes like feet! <laughs> Though hegemony is often propagated by organic intellectuals, the ruling class is distrustful of having true believers in charge, since those who do not recognise the reasons why certain ideologies are created can't be trusted to enforce them. And while ghoul kings impose control through the spread of a warped subjectivity, they are oblivious to their epistemic prison. This scene from Nagash Undying King is a nice illustration of a ghoul king's cognitive dissonance, grasping at a dormant self-awareness that is always out of reach. It's tragic, but like Don Quixote, they are still imposing a destructive fantasy that harms those around them. I guess the difference is that Sancho didn't bite out the Duke and Duchess's throats, though, to be honest, after they pulled that shit with the governorship, he fucking should've. The Flesh Eaters really put a spin on Eat the Rich, huh? It'd be like if the Jacobins stormed the Vampire Castle saying Eat the Rich and... Well, they say it in French, but... I don't know what this bit was going to be. Was, was it going to be like the Vampire Castle Mark Fisher or... I, I don't know. I, I don't know. On the subject of Jacobins, there is a Warhammer fantasy faction that the Flesh Eaters are particularly indebted to. Bretonia was a pastiche of chivalric knight tropes, exactly what ghouls think they are. And to highlight this link, Feck models have leased the Fleur de Lys. However, Bretonia didn't simply imitate knights questing for the grail stories, but combined those fanciful tropes with the bleak ugliness of medieval feud Feudalism. Bretonian peasants were horrendously brutalised by their honour-obsessed masters. In fact, you could argue that ghoul men at arms have it better than Bretonian peasants. Sure, it's in reality a degraded, monstrous existence, but at least their hegemony doesn't so explicitly codify them as inferior beings. Uh, also, free steroids. Would you rather be a yeoman? or a yokedman. If Bretonia represents the inequities of feudalism even more savagely, why is it they're not a number three? Well, this is a good example of how allegory intensifies a critique. Sorry to Bother You represents the dehumanisation and exploitation of workers through an Amazon-like corporation literally turning people into horses. It is an absurd premise, but one which manages to tackle racism and class inequality in a nuanced way. Stuart Lee ain't wrong. Animal allegories have fueled some of the greatest satirical works of all time, and also Animal Farm. I know, I know, Sorry to Bother You is more satirical for adding horses, but Flesh Eater Court is more satirical for taking the horses out. God, this is so confusing. There's an interesting question about the extent to which unskewed depictions counter satire. I threw Parasite as an example of anti-capitalist satire earlier, which eschews heightened caricature for a more believable milieu, but the farcical plot still encourages an allegorical reading. I think the key point is to distinguish between a negative narrative portrayal and a critique. I mean, most narratives portray the antagonist negatively, but you can depict something without satirising it, and you can satirise something without literally depicting it. Transcending the constraints of literal depiction is an opportunity to use some kind of metaphor or analogy that skews the perspective in a way that illuminates the critique. Allegory skews the fleshy to court to the point of a Dutch angle, while the Bretonian angle is… um… French? Bretonia does tackle feudal society with greater specificity, but the fleshy to courts aren't just satirising feudalism, there's application to both feudalism and neoliberal capitalism. While it's reductive to draw too many parallels between the politics of such different modes of production, Feck embody how ideology functions in both. These systems rely on a hegemonic consensus that downplays imperial conquest, the exploitation of labour or dictatorship of the few. All this is obscured behind ideas of defending honour or spreading democracy. It's admittedly a pretty broad satire, but very evocatively drawn. However, there is something to be said for more pointed satire. 
and that's coming right up. The Skaven are a malicious race of subterranean rat people. They've remained pretty unchanged from their beginnings in Warhammer Fantasy all the way to Age of Sigmar. Some of their models have also remained unchanged and I would not call that pretty. Here they are, tangling with fellow top fiver, the Flesh Eater Courts. Wait, this is a box art for the Carrion Empire? Skaven and Feck in one set? Truly, this is the most satirical box GW has ever sold. I guess that's why they call it Carrion Empire. <laughs> <laughs> Pomfret, we're waiting for you. I shan't be long, I'm just on the last chapter. Is <laughs> it good, you know? <laughs> Put that book down. Oh, I couldn't possibly do that. This is the latest Marquis de Sade. <laughs> Come on! Every Skaven sees himself as a genius surrounded by expendable fools, who will eventually rise to command all he surveys. The lowliest slave looks at the millions of wretches, then at the tiny fraction of those who rise to become warlords, and goes, Oh well, of course that's me. When I used the NPC meme for the Tau earlier, I was stretching the definition a bit. But the Skaven do embody the toxic thought process behind the NPC meme. Each Skaven is a narcissistic solipsist that views everyone else as an object to be possessed or exploited. It's Ayn Rand's virtue of selfishness taken to its absurd, but still recognisable, extreme. It adds up to a society which amplifies the contradictions of late capitalism. There's mention of how Skaven are so numerous they would be unstoppable if they united, but are completely unable to do it. Just like our societies have the tools to address climate change, but capitalist structures prevent us from doing so. The most iconic Skaven character, Thankful, typifies this with the constant failure of his elaborate plans, which are of course never his fault. It's incontrovertible proof of a vast conspiracy against him. Oh, and he's music using this while he's coked out of his skull on warpstone. Skaven currency is literally a narcotic. Feels like almost overgilding that metaphor. When this is the management, how could they possibly win? Every Skaven enterprise is doomed to be an Enron, a WeWork, or a Carillion. Well, maybe not a Carillion. There's this insightful paradox about the Skaven. Despite being one of the most technologically advanced races, capitalism actually hinders them from achieving their full potential. To understand this, we have to look at a tendency that free market fanatics forget, the falling rate of profit. Basically, capitalists vie to produce commodities at the lowest price, investing in constant capital, i.e. raw materials, machinery, to do so. A capitalist who improves productive efficiency is able to undercut their competition and make profit in the short term, but the market will rush to catch up and a cycle begins anew. Over time, excluding some countervailing tendencies I don't have time to get into, profits decline, which the capitalist tries to counteract by extracting more value from labour, the variable capital. This explains why Skaven technology is the way it is. Though their capitalist economy allowed them to surpass many feudal societies, innovation stalled because of a race to the bottom. Since it's not possible to extract more value from an already enslaved labour force, the scryer engineers or moulder shapers have to find other ways to outcompete rivals. As their arms economy rewards destructive efficiency, it is the investment into reliability and safety which gets squeezed out. This was elegantly represented on the tabletop, where Skaven war machines got uniquely punishing misfire mechanics, but could supercharge their power, making the tech even less safe of course. Since investing in stable technologies is unprofitable, it is unthinkable, and so the repercussions of falling profit under capitalism have stunted the Skaven's technological development. Though Skaven embody many tendencies of capitalism, they poke fun at anarcho-capitalism in particular. And it's not just showing the end result of putting Rothbard's child-selling idea into practice. There is an attack on the very fallacy of stateless capitalism. Skaven society doesn't have a traditional bourgeois government, but is instead ruled by a council of 13, an oligopoly of great clans which resemble mega corporations. Hell, they even resemble our corporations. Clan Scryer is a weapons manufacturer like BAE or Boeing. Clan Mulder specialises in biological engineering, kind of like GlaxoSmithKline with added battery farming. 
Clan Eshin offers spying and contract killing services. Add on Union and you've got a consulting company like McKinsey. As for Clan Pestilence and their cult of toxicity, I can't think of a single real life corporation that spews a similar quantity of poison. A society ruled by a group of militarised corporations sure sounds like a state to me, just a privatised one. It says a lot about how flimsy ANCAP ideology is that uh, law for a toy soldier game can pretty much articulate why its central tenant is bullshit. But wait! If we're using Skaven as an example of anarcho-capitalism in action, then we're forgetting the most important thing, roads. Skaven have forged intricate networks of underground tunnels, which only cave in 70% of the time. I think that Skaven are a pretty clear satire of capitalism, but I've seen some people claim they represent fascism. As I mentioned in the AOS story summary, Games Workshop writers don't really explain the productive base of Warhammer societies, which makes material analysis difficult. Scientific socialism has a very concrete definition, and it's pretty obvious reading the various bits of Tal lore that the writers never agreed who owns the fucking means of production. Fascism though. Fascism is a bundle of contradictory ideology expressed through violence. Its definition is as slippery as Prince Andrew claims his skin isn't, and that's a problem in real life. But ironically, since Warhammer focuses entirely on the military expression of a faction's ideology, it's pretty easy to analyse here. Umberto Eco's properties of Ur fascism are a good grounding, and uh, right off the bat, we've hit a rat. An ideology that represents enemies as simultaneously too strong and too weak is definitely true of Skaven. And this pairs well with the popular elitism category, since Skaven both hate and fear their subordinates. But Skaven lack a mass project which utilises a syncretic past. They don't even keep history. They don't care. Though they believe their race to be superior, the only member of that race that matters is them. The only time that matters is now. There is no master race, there is just the individual. I brought this up because while the Skaven don't represent fascism, they do show how capitalism in decay starts to look a hell of a lot like it. And in this case, worse. How the hell do you make fascism even worse? That would be like if Tom Hooper remakes The Sound of Music and the Christopher Plummer role goes to Kevin Spacey. Being in fascism, uh, oh this is this is not a good segue. I mentioned anti-semitism as it applies to reading Gene Steeler cults and I think we have to touch on this. I'm not Jewish, this fraught issue does not affect me in the same way. I'm not trying to portray myself as the ultimate authority. There is an unfortunate anti-Semitic association with rats, and I understand if that makes people uncomfortable. But that said, there is no cultural pastiche that I can see. Skaven dialect doesn't resemble Yiddish in the way Orc speech resembles Cockney, nor do they visually resemble a historical Semitic people like the Ogres resemble Mongolians. I feel Skaven are not a collection of anti-Semitic tropes. Well, unless. Unless you consider a critique of capitalism to be inherently anti-Semitic. Which is absurd. Anti-Semitism is called socialism for fools because it's a failure to criticise capitalism. There's no way anyone would seriously claim it's the same thing, right? It's very much part of their politics of hard left politics are anti-Jewish anti people. And In other words, to be anti-capitalist you have to be anti-Semitic. Yes. Actually, if cultural pastiche of Semitic people exists in Warhammer, then... Yep, yeah, we're back to talking Tolkien. All this cultural pastiche. You know, for such a trad guy, J.R.R. was pretty fucking postmodern. Speaking of dwarves, uh, well that's a less bad segue. Age of Sigmar features a faction of dwarves, <clears throat> of Dwarden, that make for an interesting comparison, the Caradron Overlords. Dwarves are often made to be capitalist, which you can put down as being part of the previous conversation. But I think it's more like Tolkien codified the dwarves as being technologically advanced, and then subsequent fancy writers have instinctively thought, if they're advanced, they're capitalist. You know, it's almost like hegemony is a thing. Anyway, the Caradron overlords take this to new heights. These Dwarden discovered a way to harness Ethergold to flee the threat of chaos into the skies, remaining in prosperous isolation for centuries. How about we see if a description of Caradron society rings any screaming bells? Their industry revolves around mining ether gold, a commodity with such vital use value that it backs their currency. Caradron workers belong to various guilds, the owners of which form the governing body of a skyport. The larger skyports, according to their capital, gain seats on the Geldrad Council, an oligopoly that represents the ultimate authority of Caradron society. It's kind of the same thing. However, KO society isn't as chaotic as the Skavens, and it's partly due to an adherence to a bureaucratic code of conduct. This code resembles the Star Wars. <laughs> Star Wars. 
talk. Uh, join Red Shirts Unite resembles the Star Trek Ferengi's rules of acquisition, an inconsistently applied tool of capitalist exploitation. Now this is kind of veering into Horatian satire. The battle tome has some flavorful details that display the hypocrisy of this supposed code of honor. Oh, and uh, this is kind of rare. Sanctions portrayed as actual acts of violence rather than the foreign policy equivalent of the naughty step. But let's remember the third part of the Stir system. Is this satirical critique contradicted by other parts of the text? In the early days of Caradron society, civil war was brewing and it looked like they were heading down the path of the Skaven. The code was created as a response to avert disaster, and it worked. The code imposed just enough checks on the free market to enable their prosperity. Hooray, reforms, woo! No shade on the law writers, but this is peak ideology. And Caradron society is repeatedly described as meritocratic. You know, the word originally coined to mock the myth of class mobility. The Caradron do plenty of nasty things, but there's something most of these flaws have in common. It's unpleasantness exerted on outsiders. If that's satire, then it's critiquing chauvinism, but not the actual dynamics of capitalist exploitation, because the system fundamentally works for the Dwarden living under it. None of this is to cancel the Carapitalist overlords. If there's one thing me and the GW design team agree on, it's that the Edge Chronicles fucking slapped. But it is a fascinating counterpoint. Skaven are a stagnant civilization which is undermined by its economic system, while the Caradron overlords were saved by capitalism, which only required a teensy bit of reformism to stabilize. The fact they hinged their development on a resource that they could just gather in isolation without imperialist conquest is, well, not reflective of real life capitalism. Lenin called imperialism the highest stage of capitalism, but apparently the even higher stage is Boaty Floatface. You'll notice how the Skaven and Caradron pairing parallels the Gene Stealers and Tal. One of each forwards a scathing juvenalian critique, while the other is at most a Horatian perspective, as there's enough narrative context to absolve the flaws of its political system. You'll also notice that while Ko and Skaven both represent capitalism, neither the Tal or the Gene Stealers embody actual communism. I think the AOS pairing still compares favourably to the 40k one. Yeah, I'm biased to find more value in critiques of the right than the left, but I hope even the centrists watching will understand why the Skaven's exploration of market tendencies and individualist ideology is a little more insightful than what if cultural Marxism was re? I know this section went pretty long, and that's after I cut lots of stuff, but the Skaven are just such a glowing stir system report card. Good job, rats. Here's some pocket money. Don't snort it all at once. Okay, you've been waiting patiently for this. You knew it was coming, it was inevitable. Let's get ready. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. The basic idea is that though the Imperium has satirical roots, it's become increasingly represented as the morally ambiguous protagonist faction. Some of you are likely expecting the Imperium to actually be the top spot, while the rest may have anticipated the fake out. I want this section to have something to offer both groups, especially since, unlike, say, a Gramscian analysis of the Flesh Eater Courts, analysing 40k satire is well trodden ground. I'd recommend watching some other videos on the subject, because I'll try not to be too redundant or we'll be here all day. Luckily, you already know what a space marine is. <laughs> you didn't click on the thumbnail because of the Arcanaut, did you? You did it for this chad. As Trash Future host Hussein Kazvani explains, 40k's main theme is the deconstruction of fascism. Foolish SJW, you claim the Imperium is fascist, yet in actuality it is Theocratic techno charlemagneism with Greco Roman characteristics with with elements of Judeo Christian Catholic Let me be terse. Umberto Eco's definition of fascism? Yep, 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 for sure, yep. I guess. Oh, yep, yep, oh, yep, 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 yep. Oh, it can't be fascist. If it's a monarchy, a theocracy, or feudal, you'll realise Nazi Germany wasn't the only fascist state, right? Yeah, the Imperium has a monarch and a state religion policed by an extra-legal church. You know, like Francoist Spain? Yes, it's an expansive empire which devolves power similarly to feudalism, but that's because its authority has crumbled since the Great Crusade. 
While there's a portion of 40k fans who deny fascism because they're hiding their power levels, there's also a significant chunk who sincerely argue that it's an authoritarian neo-feudal monarchist theocracy instead. Okay, we get it, you play paradox games. Speaking of paradoxes, funny how the same people who think it's clever to describe the Imperium with word salad also think AOS names are stupid. Look, I don't mean to be dismiss- I don't mean to be too dismissive, it's just this has the same energy as dog? Heavens no, this is Fido, a Springer Spaniel breed of Canis Lupus Familiaris. Like, it's not technically wrong, but it isn't a counter-argument. Fascism is at the core of what the Imperium is. Its central ideology and iconography explicitly emphasise this. So let's get into that. Early 40k was heavily indebted to 80s pulpy punk. The Imperium was a morbid caricature, and its space marines were ghoulishly grotesque. Like Judge Dredd, some of that bite comes from drawing allegorical similarities to Thatcherism. Not a great leap considering how she pandered to nationalists at home while supporting the regimes overseas. And of course there's the occupation of Ireland. Rogue Trader has some art which is clearly casting space marines as the Brits. Though much of what Rogue Trader established remained canon insofar as canon exists, 40k was still in flux and it wasn't until 3rd edition that comedy was excised in favour of that famous grim dark tone. I do I think this gets overemphasised as the death of satire moment though. My list has shown that satirical factions can be wacky and they can be grim. In some ways, Grimdark actually manifests 40k's most coherent theme, that fascism doesn't work. The Imperium is repeatedly emphasised as the most horrific regime conceivable, a leviathan of galactic genocide that subsists on the slaughter of conscripts, functionally enslaved hive city dwellers, or actually enslaved lobotomized cyborgs. The extreme adherence to Echo's categories of popular elitism and death cult heroism is hammered home in this interaction. Do the deaths of your soldiers mean so little to you? Are you with that mad? Do the deaths of yours mean so much to you, alien? Are you that weak? All of this is dreadfully silly, an observation that will annoy the most slavish devotees of seriousness, but 40k's Grimdark proves camp to be a tonal horseshoe. This is not just a negative portrayal, but a critique of how fascism's problems are often self-inflicted. Chaos's ascendancy is the fault of the Imperium at every level. New worshippers arise because of the crushing inequalities of Hive cities, while the corruption of space marines was a result of the Emperor's arrogant misinformation. And this fascistic ideology of ignorance is really underscored. Alongside tirades about the vile degeneracy of non-humans, it's common to see Imperial propaganda about ignorance being a virtue. Okay, that's a fair summary of the ways the Imperium is satirical. Even if intent is subordinate to content, there's a recognisable counterculture early 40k's channeling and <laughs> it ain't fucking Britpop. But that's only half the story, because these satirical themes are made contradictory and jarring. There are three main ways this critique is jarred, which appropriately spells the acronym JAR. Justification is something well covered in Salamander and Jumbled Reviewers videos. We've seen how the gene stealers validate neo-Nazi paranoia, and while that's an extreme example, the story broadly justifies the Imperium's doctrine of genocidal xenophobia. The major alien factions are literally trying to kill them. Xenophobia is written as irrational fanaticism on the individual level, but on the macro level, it, it's rational. Oh, um, Dawn has a take about this, uh, that, that I've chosen to include voluntarily by by choice. So you know how 40k was inspired by Judge Dredd, right? Well, the most famous Judge Dredd stories are these three stories, the Judge Death Saga. But what's interesting about it is how it humanizes Judge Dredd. To give the basics, the story is about an alternate universe evil judge who has decided that on his universe, life is a crime and the only justifiable punishment is death. So he's basically just an incoherent, evil, prime evil force. And because of this, Judge Dredd in facing him becomes justified. He's a fascist, but because he's up against someone who's so much worse, he is the hero. Since I'm already treating factions as stable collections of traits, I might as well personify them even further to use character engagement theory. Murray Smith's structure of sympathy is a useful framework to talk about audience alignment with characters, which is formed in two ways. Spatial temporal attachment is how much presence a character has in the narrative, and subjective access is the degree to which we experience their point of view, emotions and inner life. Now, no amount of alignment automatically guarantees sympathetic allegiance, but come on. 
With proximity comes normalization, with understanding comes justification, so protagonist privilege. The Imperium's point of view is, well, hegemonic, and not just in Codex lore but also novels, like the absurdly long-running Horus Heresy series that dramatises both sides of the split. The best of these books portray both sides as being wrong. Nice, ambiguous. Throw out your Bugs Life DVDs because we got some new ants here. However, all of this attachment means there's an implicit hierarchy of whose motivations are worth explaining in detail, and whose remain vague or inscrutable, and therefore less relatable. Such a crushing weight of narrative alignment is at odds with satirical caricature. There is a tonal departure from both the absurdity of early 40k and the oppressive grimness that replaced it, which sees the increasing romanticism of space marines. Not, not in like in a sexy... Y y you know what I mean. If we wanted to be simplistic, we could focus on how these fascist super soldiers get whitewashed into mascots and Funko Pops. Don't worry, <laughs> this isn't going to be a rant about how Warhammer Adventures is the worst thing to happen to my childhood since the primal scene or whatever that Far Cry game is called. Though this stuff does undercut the theme, it would be less of a problem if there was a clearer, contrasting delineation between this playful sanitization and the main canon. Let's take the return of Primarch Reboot Gilliman. There's an obvious aesthetic shift from tableaus which depict the horror of fascism to those which embody their romantic ideal, but that's only part of it. GW likes to use this very evocative Gilliman quote, in which he decries the Imperium for being driven by hate and ignorance. Okay, same page, but he also also claims the Imperium of his time was driven by reason and hope. That's wrong of course, novels like Horus Rising depict the dormant contradictions at its heart that make self-destruction inevitable. But, in aligning us with Gilliman as the narrative's protagonist and using the disastrous current state of the Imperium as a counterpoint, we are encouraged to agree with this revisionism. It's make the Imperium great again, when it was still fascist but at least everyone was an atheist. Bad take mate, downs oated. Now, you'd think reactionaries would prefer a milieu that idealises space marines, but they tend to complain that 40k is becoming noble bright. I think the explanation is partly that they're bad at reading texts, but also they'd actually prefer the version that depicts their ideology as disastrous in exchange for a grimmer tone that makes them feel like mature adults. So if you're keeping score, the fash seem to care more about looking grown than getting owned. So what we have is postmodern parody as described by Hutchin, twofold legitimization and subversion of its subject, a situation where god emperor memes can be a huge own or a flattering comparison depending on the beholder. As Jumbled Reviewer points out, Warhammer 40k stumbles into the brilliant observation that fascism can never win. If the theme of fascism not working is contradicted by narrative context justifying it, is the text implying that fascism is a necessary evil just implemented inefficiently? You can see why I'm not focusing on any particular piece of 40k fiction, but the context all of them are working in. There is an old Cahiers de Cinema article which sheds some light on this. Camoli and Narboni categorise films based on their relationship to dominant ideology. Most films unreflectively embody it, others resist it, but more pertinent are the next two categories. Categories. There are films which have explicitly political content but don't effectively criticise the ideological system, so embedded in its language and form that they actually strengthen what they seek to denounce. You know, like the Brexit movie, which thinks it's deconstructing straw men but ends up building a fucking hay bale kaiju. Then there is the opposite case, films which seem at first sight to strengthen the dominant ideology but turn out to do so in an ambiguous manner. An internal criticism is taking place which cracks the film apart at its seams and the ideology becomes subordinate to the text. There's there's an unspoken division within this category between the unintentional, like John Ford's The Searchers, and the deliberate, like Verhoeven's Starship Troopers. And that's the funny thing about 40k's Imperium, it kind of straddles these seemingly mutually exclusive categories. To observant folks, who recognise the explicit political themes the Imperium embodies, it belongs in the former category, a text which tries to deconstruct fascism but makes choices that undermine effective criticism. To reactionary fans, it embodies the latter category, though the text is ambiguous enough to be appropriated, its foundations fracture and undermine their attempts to read the Imperium as unironic 
heroes. I should say that when Camoli and Arboni mention ideology, they refer to the capitalist mode that produces film, so I'm vulgarising the theory a little. But on another level, it's perfect, since it shows how GW's corporate mandate for profitable accessibility sanitises the Imperium's fascism. In summary, people who idolise the Imperium are still pitiable, but they're unwittingly picking up on real contradictions within the text. Bet you didn't expect such a centrist take after all that Marxist theory. Well, deal with it. This is Warhammer 40 Cuck. Nice as it would be to see Rogue Trader's tone return with Codex Slam Sector Gimme Danger, there's zero chance of that happening. Echoes of it live on, in the Regimental Standard or with fan-made projects like If the Emperor Had a Text-to-Speech Device, and if you just want more old hammer in your life, Snipe and Wib are great. Still, you might find yourself wondering if Jane's Workshop will ever pry open that jar. Dealing with the justification part would require rewriting like half of the factions in the game, unless they introduce a prominent alternative to the Imperium's fascism, a reformed Interex faction or something. Mind you, the Tau were hated when they launched. Since the alignment issue is insurmountable when Marines are the protagonists, perhaps the only part of Jar GW could realistically get a handle on is the Romanticism. Considering the upcoming Eisenhorn show has the potential to push 40k further into the mainstream, it's worth noting that quality TV is defined by anti-hero shows which rather than satirical critique concepts unflinchingly depict immoral protagonists. In fact, this conflict between alignment and allegiance is the difficulty that has elevated people's perceptions of TV from being a low-brow medium. Many anti-hero shows have the same problem with bad fans, but it doesn't always reflect as badly on the text, since ambiguity is often baked into the style rather than as a result of a contradicted allegory. The Imperium will always have satirical foundations, but perhaps GW needs to move away from this hollowed out version of Starship Troopers and lean into the de-romanticized ambiguity of the shield. Actually, I could make a whole video about the interesting parallels between the shield and the Horus Heresy, but that would require me making another video about 40k. And this video... It's a one-time war crime and I apologize. As you've guessed, the top 5 list format was a bit of a ruse. The two Warhammer factions I'm essentially required to talk about in a video about satire are, ironically, pretty bad examples of it. The Orcs have a load of unfocused themes, whereas the Imperium does have a strong critique, but it's contradicted to the point of incoherence. Across Games Workshop's IPs, three satirical takes really stand out. A scathing critique of capitalism, a savage depiction of hegemony, and a Nazi conspiracy theory. Jesus fucking Christ. When 40k fails at satire it's bad, but when it succeeds it's even worse. Oh, you think I'm being unfair to 40k? Count the people enraged I explained how narrative context absolves the character and overlords. Okay, now how about those pissed off I did the same thing for the Tau? As those two examples demonstrate though, there are many Warhammer factions which have such strong political content that they're on the cusp of satire, and since I already crammed 9 factions in under an hour, uh. Why not hit double digits? I want to pick up this idea about satire being something when there's animals in it. Right. Can I ask you some yes or no questions? Yes. A Kleenex box with a shrew in it? Satire? No. A wolf with a duck in it? Yep. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A conker with a wasp in it? Yep. A glove box full of elves? Satire. Dum dum bullet with a woodlouse in it. Satire. A shipping container with a turtle in it. Satire. Toilet bowl full of goats. Satire. A limpet shell with a limpet in it. That's doubly satirical to the point where it could almost be too serious. A crow inside a swift. Yes, that works. They're two different birds. Sausages. Not on their own, no. 